Okay, let's continue talking about the elementary and complete symmetric polynomials. So last time I had said that uh, let's assume that n is large. Okay, when we define the um, polynomials e lambda and h lambda, but actually it turns out it's not really necessary. The reason I I made that assumption was uh, so that only if I have enough variables can I be sure that e lambda one of x, lambda two of x, and so on are all non-zero polynomials. But uh, recall e lambdas, e, you know, e n or, or e d was defined for any value of d. If d is bigger than n, then e d was defined to be zero. That's all. Okay. So even if if n is not large compared to lambdas, uh, this this definition still makes sense. Just that e lambda could become zero. That's all. If n is small relative to the lambdas. Okay. But we don't really care at this point. Okay, so let, let me just uh, make this correction to the definition from last time. Okay, so given a partition lambda, we define e lambda and h lambda like this. Uh, e lambda, like I said, could be 0. h lambda, of course, would never be 0. Okay, and the key point here is that the degree of e lambda, e lambda and h lambda are in fact homogeneous symmetric polynomials of degree d. Okay, and that, that's clear from the definition. So now uh, that brings us to this interesting question. We already have a nice z basis for the space of uh, homogeneous symmetric polynomials, which is the monomial symmetric function. So let me just introduce some notation Let me call capital lambda n to be the space of all uh, symmetric polynomials in n variables. x1, x2, xn and lambda n superscript d will just denote the homogeneous ones of degree d. Okay, So this is uh, homogeneous, homogeneous symmetric polynomials x1, x2, xn of degree d. Okay, so now what we know is that the e lambdas and h lambdas, so we just said the following, if we take e lambda of x, x being x1, x2, xn, let's write that out. And this belongs to the space for d being the sum of the lambdas. Okay, I recall this definition mod lambda just is the sum and the same for h. So the natural question is, uh, we already have the monomial symmetric functions, which we know form a basis for the space lambda and d. Okay, so recall now that the, the monomial symmetric functions so let's call it m mu mu belonging to p n p d n so consider this this set they form a z basis okay so recall this fact from one of the earlier lectures so what this means is that the, the natural next question is to see if we can express e lambda and h lambda as a linear combination of the m mu's. Okay, so, so let's see if we can do that. Here's the theorem which tells us what this expression is. So fix n and let lambda be a partition of D, okay. then h lambda, so two statements, number one says h lambda of x is the following linear combination. Uh, the, the coefficients are called m lambda mu times the monomial symmetric function m mu of x1, x2, xn. Now what does mu vary over? It's over all partitions of D 
into at most n non-zero parts. Okay, and so I'll tell you in a moment what this coefficient capital M lambda mu is. Let's also write out the corresponding statement for E. This is again a sum over the same set of mu's and now the coefficients are called n lambda mu's where so let's describe the the m and n where m lambda mu is the following it's the number of matrices okay it's the number of matrices Let's give it a name AIJ. These are entries of the matrices of size. So, what's the size of the matrix that we are talking about? Of size, well, how many rows does it have? As many rows as the, the length of lambda. And the number of columns is the length of mu. So, recall length is the number of non zero parts in lambda and similarly in mu. So, it's the number of matrices AIJ of size length lambda cross length mu satisfying the following conditions such that so there are two conditions that need to be satisfied number one the entries are elements of z plus okay meaning they are non negative integers and uh, the second condition is that the row sums so, so j going from 1 to length of mu so this is the sum of the i row should give me the element lambda i okay and similarly the 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 column sum so this is the i row sum if you wish similarly the jth column sum of this matrix aij i running from uh, 1 to length of lambda this should be element mu j so this is the jth column sum okay so uh, just said loosely we are looking at all integer matrices whose row sums give you lambda the the parts of lambda and the column sums give you the parts of mu okay so this is the the description of m lambda mu and n lambda mu likewise uh, equals the number of matrices as above the number of matrices as above but satisfying a slightly different first condition such that instead of the condition 1 it satisfies a condition 1 dash which is that AIJs are not allowed to be arbitrary non-negative integers but only 0 or 1 okay and condition 2 is the same so 2 dash same condition as 2. The row sums are lambdas and the column sums are mu's. Okay, so let's uh, stare at it once more. So here's a statement. So we will prove one of them, the other will be very similar. So I'll just prove the first one, uh, which gives you the expansion for h lambda. Okay, so the claim is that h lambdas give you summation m lambda mu times the monomial symmetric function m mu where these, these coefficients have this very nice interpretation, combinatorial interpretation as the number of integer matrices, non-negative integer matrices, whose row sums give you lambda and whose column sums give you mu. Okay, And the other one is similar except you only allow the entries of the matrix to be zeros or ones. Okay, good. So let's, uh, let's prove this statement. So the proof is actually uh, quite simple. The statement looks a bit, um, you know, unexpected. If you've never seen things like this before, but the proof is actually quite simple. So let's let's write this out. So what's the proof? So I'll just prove the very first statement about h lambda. So what is h lambda? By definition, it's the product h lambda one, h lambda two, and so on. Okay, and let me say it's got l part h lambda l of x. Okay, now uh, what do we know? The total degree is d. Okay. Okay, now th this is known to be of degree d, of course. 
Now what we know of course is that because it is of degree d, h lambda must be expressible as a linear combination which means that h lambda must be expressible as a linear combination of the monomial symmetric functions of degree d. Okay, so mu running over pdn for some integers c lambda mu for some c lambda mu belonging to z. Okay. So the, the thing we need to prove is that the c's are exactly given by the m's okay, for all relevant lambdas and mu's. Okay, now uh, let's try and prove this. So what was uh, c lambda mu? So let's prove our claim now. Okay, so recall whenever you expand uh, a, a symmetric function in terms of the monomial symmetric functions that coefficient c lambda mu is actually very easy to describe. Okay, what is this? Uh, it's the coefficient of a certain special monomial. So observe this is actually the coefficient of the special monomial x to the mu in the left hand side in h lambda of x. Okay, why is that? Because that particular monomial recall x to the mu appears only in one of the monomial symmetric functions. It appears only in this guy m mu. Okay, this is the only monomial symmetric function which contains the term x mu. None of the others contain the term x mu. Okay, and further in this in m mu that term x mu comes with coefficient 1. Okay. So if you just compare the coefficients of x mu on the left hand side and right hand side, you observe on the right hand side that coefficient is exactly c lambda mu times 1. Okay, So that's exactly what we have said here. The coefficient of x mu in h lambda of x is, is exactly what we wrote. Okay, Now uh, good, so this is really what we are trying to calculate. We are trying to show that this coefficient must be uh, given by m lambda mu. Okay, so let's do this. So let's see how we would compute the coefficient of any given term in h lambda of x. Well, h lambda was a product, right? So it was a product of h lambda 1, h lambda 2 and so on. So what does h lambda 1 look like? So recall what's the complete symmetric function. It's just a sum of all the monomials of that particular um, degree. So I have to just sum x to the alpha where alpha ranges over all possible multi indices whose sum equals lambda 1. Sorry, this should be a lambda 1 here. Okay, now similarly, let's go on to the next term. So, what's h lambda 2 similarly? h lambda 2 of x. Likewise, will just be a sum of all monomials x beta, beta running over all possibilities, multi indices whose sum is lambda 2. Okay, and so on. Let's do one more h lambda 3. All monomials whose sum is lambda 3, etc. Okay, and now what are we trying to do? We are trying to multiply all these things out. That's what h lambda is. So what is h lambda going to be? It's, it's going to have all the x alphas, x betas, x commas and so on. Okay. Now, when you expand, so you, you expand this big product out, okay, each bracket is itself a sum. So how do you expand? Okay, so you, you just expand this, this thing completely, writing out all the terms. Now, how do you actually get a term in the, in the final expansion? Well, you get a term as follows. You pick one term from the first bracket, right? So how do you how do you get a term? You will pick from the first bracket at least one of the alphas. So from the first bracket, let's say I pick some alpha. Pick an alpha from the first bracket. Now from the second bracket, I pick one term. Let's say I pick some some beta. From the third term, I pick from third bracket, I pick one of the terms in the sum, some some gamma, and so on. Right. So you form a final term in this expansion by picking one term from the first, one term from the second, one term from the third and so on. Okay. Now, those terms are all what? They are all some multi indices, right? I pick some alpha 
from the first bracket some beta from the second and so on so i keep track of what i picked in each of them okay so pick expand completely by how are we going to do this by picking one term from each bracket Now what we do is we just record our record these terms in a matrix as follows. Okay, you record the terms that you picked as follows. You write uh, you write those multi -C, multi indices out in a matrix form. Okay, how do you do it? So you 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 write a matrix whose first row will contain the choice alpha. So whatever alpha I picked from the first um, term, that alpha I will write in the first row. Whatever beta I picked from the second term, that beta I write in the second row of my matrix. Whatever I picked from the third, I write that as gamma and so on. Okay. So I, I form a matrix like this in which I have essentially recorded my choices. How did I pick various terms? Which term did I pick from each of the brackets? Okay, now observe we are already getting something like what we want because uh, the alpha was what you got from the first term, right? And what was the first term? It was the expansion, let's go up, it was the expansion of h lambda 1. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that that multi-index alpha that you picked from the first term must satisfy summation alpha i is exactly lambda 1. Okay, similarly the second term that you picked, summation beta i is lambda 2. From the third bracket, whatever gamma you pick, it must satisfy summation gamma i is lambda 3 and so on. So in other words, this sum, the row sum, so this fellow has row sum is exactly lambda 1 by definition more or less. This row sum is exactly lambda 2. This row sum is lambda 3 and so on. Okay, so this matrix certainly has sort of the right feel. Now let's see what we intended to do. We wanted to calculate a certain coefficient. We wanted to find out the coefficient of x power mu in this in this expansion, right? So in this entire expansion, you perform it and try to pick out a single term. I want to know what is the coefficient of x power mu. Now how do I do that? So uh, you know how will I how will I get it? Okay. So now this matrix. So let's uh, observe the following. Uh, each such matrix, therefore each such matrix corresponds to one term in the expansion to one term in the expansion of the product h lambda 1 of x h lambda 2 of x and so on okay now it's it's one term of, of what form so as we said x power first row x power second row is what you get from third guy x power gamma like that right but what is this term really let's write it out in terms of the n variables x1 x2 xn the first term x power alpha just means x1 alpha 1 x2 alpha 2 etc x beta means x1 beta 1 x gamma x1 gamma 1 x2 gamma 2 etc and so on right i have to do it for all the the terms here now uh, you know there are l of them so this will finally end at x h lambda l of x so i guess i okay it's not enough space there so let's write this downstairs times h lambda l of x that's the last term Okay, now let's let's complete this uh, calculation. You know, this is the term in the product, but now I will arrange it in powers of x1. So, what's the total power of x1? It's alpha 1 plus beta 1 plus gamma 1 and so on. What's the total power of x2? Alpha 2 plus beta 2 plus gamma 2, etc. Plus and so on, right? This is true for all the variables. So what, what are these, these final exponents then? What's alpha 1 plus beta 1 plus gamma 1 and so on in terms of that matrix that we wrote out. Okay, let's go back up. What's this matrix here? Alpha 1 is just the entry in the first, you know, right in the beginning, beta 1, gamma 1 and so on. 
So alpha 1 plus beta 1 plus gamma 1 is actually nothing but the first column sum of this matrix. So in other words, in terms of this matrix, this final term actually has a nice interpretation. This is nothing but x1 to the first column sum. So column sum 1. Okay, maybe you should call it column 1 sum. It's the sum of column 1, x2 to the second column sum and so on, x3 to the third column sum. So that's the final guy. Okay, now what is it that I want? So observe each matrix corresponds to one such term. The uh, the, the term that it corresponds to are just x1 to the you know x1 to the first column sum x2 to the second column sum and so on now what is it that we are interested in therefore we want the coefficient of a particular monomial coefficient of x to the mu okay, what does x to the mu mean x1 to the mu1 x2 to the mu2 and so on right so what does this mean this means that the matrix we are looking for had better have first column sum mu1 second column sum mu2 and so on Right. Therefore, uh, the matrix that we wrote out alpha, beta, etc. The choices has column J sum, the jth column sum to be equal to mu J. Okay. So observe that's that's more or less a proof. The ith row sums we already said are exactly the lambda. Right. This, this we already observed that the ith row sums are lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, etc. And now the jth column sum, since we want to pick out a particular term x to the mu, that just says that the jth column sums are the mu j's. So each such matrix which satisfies both these properties, row sums are lambdas and column sums are mu's, every such matrix will give me one such term x power mu. Okay. And therefore, the, the, there will be many, many matrices which can give me the x power mu and the coefficient that I am interested in therefore c lambda mu is therefore nothing but the total coefficient that I will get for this x mu in the product etc. is actually nothing but the total number of such matrices is exactly well that was what we called m lambda mu the total number of matrices satisfying the following properties that all the entries are non-negative integers, the row sums are all lambda i's, the column sums are the mu j's. Okay, so that, that finishes the proof. So just a little, uh, uh, little note here, so observe the way I formed the matrix, what's the size of the matrix, you maybe, um, you know, you should be a little concerned maybe about the size of the matrix. See the, the matrix sizes are, you know, what did I say, we'll write the alpha in the first row. Right. What are the alphas? The alphas are just the alpha is a multi index, it, it's just the power of x1, x2, x3 till xn. Right. So, actually, there are n columns if you think about it. Right. So, the size of the matrix is the way I formed it, there are n columns, and the rows, of course, it's, it's equal to the length of lambda because there is one, one row for each part lambda i that I have. So the rows are okay, they are length lambda, but the columns seem to be n rather than length of mu. Okay. But this is not uh, uh, too serious because, I mean, it's correct as, as stated, it's actually only n rather than length of mu. But finally, the matrices that we care about, the ones which count the coefficient of x power mu, those are going to be the ones which satisfy this additional condition, right? That the, the column sums are mu1, mu2 and so on. And let's say there are only the length of mu is k, then I, I, you know, the mu and mu two, mu k are the only non-zero parts, and all the subsequent columns are supposed to just sum up to zero, right? So you remember, I have to pad this mu with zeros at the end. Mu remember is a partition of D with at most n parts, less than or equal to n parts. So this matrix that I am interested in, the at the end, I I will have some you know columns which have to sum up to zero now the only way those columns can sum up to zero is if all the entries are zeros in the in those columns so in fact the the only matrices i'm looking for are you know if, if you want to think of them as length lambda cross n matrices then the final n minus k columns are going to have zeros in. 
So I might as well throw them out and only think about matrices of size, length lambda cross k, but k is length of mu. Okay, so here I am assuming k is length. Just a little uh, point if you are worried about that. Okay, good. So that's the end of the proof, and uh, the the other case is similar. Okay, so uh, e lambda uh, case is analogous. Okay, so I'm going to leave that as an as an exercise for you guys to try it. Okay, so this is one of the the first uh, uh, you know in in sort of a broad paradigm which will be there throughout the study of symmetric polynomials, which is that you define uh, newer and newer classes of symmetric polynomials, and then the question becomes how does one write this new class of polynomials as a linear combination of every one of the older classes of polynomials that we know about. Okay, So we will we'll soon do this. So, so far we have three classes of polynomials, the monomial, the elementary and the, the complete. So far we know that the monomials form a basis, a z basis. We will say something about the elementary and complete as well eventually. But soon we will talk about other classes of polynomials, uh, most importantly the, the sure polynomials. And then the question becomes how does one write the sure polynomials in terms of the monomials or how does one write that in terms of the elementary or the complete and so on. So this, this whole problem of expressing one class of polynomials in terms of the other or in finding what are called these, you know, these transition matrices, the entries of the transition matrix, uh, that's a very important problem in this, this whole subject of symmetric functions. Okay.